Good afternoon, my brothers and sisters. This is Pastor Bill Keith. Uh, beside still waters down here on the banks of the Wekaiva on the in Gulf Hammock, Florida. I want to start a study tonight in the book of Hebrews. Uh, I'm going to be preaching a series of sermons in the book of June on resting in Jesus. We've been talking about putting Jesus first, Matthew 6.33, where it said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And as we've developed that thought over the past couple of months, <clears throat> this next section of that we're going to be looking at is uh, resting in Jesus. What does that mean to rest in Jesus? And uh, we're going to take you to a, a passage of Scripture that uses that word rest time and again. It just it blew my mind how many times the word rest was used in one chapter. And we're going to get there in, in a week or two. But tonight I want you to go with me to the book of Hebrews. Excuse me. Chapter 1, verse 1. And, it, and the word says this. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many por portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the, is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee, and again I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, And let all the angels of God worship him. And the, of the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire? But of the Son, he says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy companions. And thou, Lord, in the beginning didst lay the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They will perish, but thou remainest. And they all will become old as a garment, and as a mantle thou wilt roll them up. As a garment they, they will be also be changed, but thou art the same. And thy years will not come to an end. And to which of the angels did he ever said, Sit at my right hand, until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? Let's uh, pray tonight and ask God to bless the reading of his word. We'll go back and look at what God's saying here in the scriptures. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I come before you on behalf of my sisters and brothers tonight. Lord, there's some that are facing some serious health challenges, and we ask for your special touch, your special healing in their lives. There are others that are facing, facing financial difficulties. I pray that you'll meet the needs that they have, Lord, supply the, the funding and supply the things they need, Lord. You promised to do that, so we ask you to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. This passage of Scripture is a, is a wonderful passage of Scripture and starts right out really proclaiming the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, a lot of people think that Jesus was just God's little boy and he was like less than God. And, and uh, the Scripture makes it so very plain that the uh, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are equal in their nature. They're all three part of the Godhead. And Jesus Christ, the Son, uh, here it says in, in verses 1 and 2, said, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many different ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. See, a lot of people don't really understand that the creator, the one that actually created this earth, is Jesus Christ. It, it says so right there. And if you go to John chapter 1, we'll go over there just for a minute, uh, some of the cults change this, this pa passage of scripture because uh, this passage of scripture is so plain about who Jesus really is. John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now listen to this. All things came into being by him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 
and he goes on to say that uh, the the uh, John there, uh, John the Baptist, came before him and, and proclaimed who he really was. And when he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, he was saying a mouthful, wasn't he? Because he was proclaiming the, the Jesus Christ, the creator of the world, the, the image of the very firstborn of, of God. Here it says, He has spoken in these last days through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3 in, in Hebrews, back in Hebrews 1 again, says, And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the power of his word. When he hath made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Do you remember in, in Genesis where God created the world and it said, and, and we, we didn't know until now who that was doing that, but it was Jesus Christ doing the creating. He said he's the one that made the world. But, the, but Genesis says that on the, after the six days, what happened? It said the Lord rested on the seventh day. It wasn't that he was just worn out and he had to t had to take a nap and sit down and, and just, uh, you know, go, go to sleep. It wasn't that at all. It's, it's the same thing as you and I. When we finish a great project and we're, we are so full of wonder and satisfaction that God has allowed us to do that and we go, thank you, God. We're finished with it. And that's, how, that's what it was. When he rested, he ceased doing his creative work and uh, he, he was finished. He finished that work, and later on on the cross, when he cried out, it is finished, he was talking about what he did for us, the, paying for the sins of the world and paying for our sins. That it, He paid every single thing that needed to be paid. Jesus Christ paid it on Calvary a long time ago. And as you, as you think about that tonight, I want you to think about uh, the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, meaning that Jesus is God. He's equal to God. And we don't need to, to minimize that. We don't need to... Uh, bring Jesus down and make him something less than God. He claimed to be God. In fact, John, John 8, I want to read a passage of Scripture that will kind of rock your world if you've never seen it. In John chapter 8, and uh, I'm going to get there in just a second. You can be turning in your Bible if you have it. In John chapter 8, uh, verse 48, And Jews answered and said to him, Do you not say rightly that you're a Samaritan and you have a demon? <laughs> Jesus said, I don't have a demon. But I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. See, when you talk about Jesus and you criticize Jesus, you're criticizing who God sent. You're criticizing the very Son of God. He says, you're criticizing my Father who sent me. Verse 50, but I do not, do not seek my glory. This is John 8, 50. But I do not seek my glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Then the Jews said to them, now we know you have a demon. Abraham died and the prophets also. And you say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Surely you're not greater than our father Abraham who died. The prophets died too. Who, who do you make yourself out to be? He said, who do you think you are? We're well, saying these kind of things. Verse 54, Jesus said, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me of whom you say he's our God. Verse 55, and you have not come to know him, but I know him. And if I say that I don't know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham, verse 56, rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Verse 57, the Jews therefore said to him, You're not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Abraham had died a thousand years or a couple thousand years before this. Verse 58, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Do you know why they wanted to stone him? Because Jesus was claiming the very same name that Jehovah God claimed in, in back in the book of uh, Exodus when uh, God sent Moses to deliver the children of Israel. And Moses said, I don't know what to tell him your name is. I, I, I hear you and I know that you're the God, but who are you and what's your name? He said, you tell him that I am sent you. I am that I am. And when he, when he said that name to the Jews, they knew who he was talking about. And they knew Jehovah God had sent him. And here Jesus is claiming the same name. And, the, and they picked up stones to stone him because he claimed equality with the, with the, with the God. And, and they, didn't, they couldn't stand it. They just went ballistic and wanted to kill him. But it wasn't his time, so he slipped out of, his, out of, the, out of the temple there and hid himself because it was not time for him to die on the cross yet. 
But see, there's a lot of people today that don't, they think that Jesus is some little boy of God, you know, like the little son of God, and he's just like this little kid that God sent to do his work, and, and they don't understand who he really was. It was, uh, in fact, when we sing that song at Christmas time, God incarnate deity, we've sang that so many times and we don't even think about it. You know, we're, we're talking about when God became flesh and he came in the form of a little baby lived as a, as a human, put on human flesh, and lived here for 33 years before he went back to heaven. And he, he came here on a, on a mission to save people like you and like me. Now, Hebrews is going to get real interesting. We're not going to get too far into it tonight because I want to take you there a little deeper later. But uh, in chapter, in Hebrews, if you move over a little bit into chapter 3, and uh, over in verse... We'll go here, uh, chapter 3, verse 12. Take care, brethren, lest there should be any one of you with an evil, unbelieving heart and falling away from the living God. It's easy to fall away from the living God and not believe what he said and what you ought to be doing about it. It's, and then you go down to verse 19. It says, and so we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. It's using an illustration here of something that happened to the Jewish people in, in the Old Testament in uh, Numbers chapter 12. I'm going to take you there just for a minute, and we're going to close, or in chapter 14, excuse me. We're going to go there, and we're going to back up into chapter 13. And you, you remember when the children of Israel were there, at the, they were at the door of the Promised Land. They had been slaves in Egypt all those years. God brought them through the Red Sea, delivered them through many, many miracles, and here they were at the door of entering this promised land, the land of Canaan that God had promised them. And he said, you know, time to go get, go in and inherit your land. And so they sent in 12 spies. You remember that? They went in there and they spied the land out. In uh, verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 25, when they, when they returned from spying out the land at the end of 40 days, these 12 spies went all over the land of Canaan looking it over. They came to Moses and Aaron in uh, verse 27, said, We went into the land where you sent us, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey. And this, and here's some of the fruit. Joshua and Caleb brought back some big old giant clusters of grapes to show them. And nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong, they said. And the cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of the giants there, Anak there. And the Amaleks live there, and the, and the Hittites and the Jebusites. And the Canaanites are all there. And they're, said. And then verse 30 says, Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, We should go by all means up and take possession of it, for we shall surely overcome it. But the, in verse 31, But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against these people. for They're too strong for us. So they gave, out, gave the sons of Israel a bad report of the land, which they spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone, and spying it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people who we saw were men of great size. Said in verse 33. Then we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, the, the giants, you know. And we looked like grasshoppers to them. In verse 14, or chapter 14, verse 1. Then all it congregation lifted up their voices and cried. And the people wept that night. And the, all the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation and said to them, would that we had died in the land of Egypt. Would we had died in the wilderness. And why is the Lord bringing us into this land to, so we die? Our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said one to another, let us appoint a leader and return to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces in the presence of all the assembly of the congregation in Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephthah, of whom had spied out the land toward their clothes. And they spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to spy is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord be pleased with us or is pleased with us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they shall be our prey. Their protection has been removed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear. Verse 10, chapter 14 of Numbers. But the congregation said to but all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Then the glory of the Lord appeared in the tent of meeting to all the sons of Israel. 
their rebellion against God there at this particular point brought the wrath of God down and God got so angry he was going to destroy the whole congregation all of Israelites to start all over wasn't just Moses and Moses begged him please Lord don't do that show show kindness to this bunch of rebels that didn't listen to you and and the Lord decided not to destroy them because of Moses' intercession for them in chapter 14 there. There were only two spies that brought back a good report, Caleb and Joshua. God got so mad that he, he pronounced a curse upon that older generation. And he said, I am not going to let one of those people, one of those people of that generation enter that land. The very children, they thought that the giants and the, uh, the inhabitants of that land will, would devour and kill. I'm going to let those kids go and conquer that land, but it's going to take a long time because I'm going to wait. The Lord said, I'm going to wait till all of you die off, and then I'm going to let them go in and take that land. And you know the rest of the story. First, go back to Hebrews chapter 3 again, verse 19. So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. The whole theme that I'm going to be preaching on is is resting in Jesus, and I haven't. I'm really developing that sermon right now for you, for the first week of June. We've got one more week in, in uh, May, and we're having uh, a special graduation uh, ceremony, not a ceremony, but a service for the girls and that have graduated from our school. But the following week, I'm going to start preaching on this theme, and it's resting in Jesus, and really based upon this verse in Hebrews chapter four, verse nine says there remains therefore rest for the people of God there, there remains therefore a Sabbath rest or a rest for the people of God I want you to be thinking on that resting in Jesus what does it mean to rest in Jesus what does it mean to reach that point of, of rest when you can just rest and enjoy life without worrying and fretting and having fear what does it mean to do that and how can you achieve that because see the promise is right there the Jews could have, they, it was only a, a 11, 12, 13 day journey from when they came out of the Red Sea to the, to the door of the promised land. And they came right up to the promised land and they rebelled against God. They didn't take the land. And see, a Christian can do the same thing today. See, God has a, a special place of rest for you and he has a special spirit-filled life for you. But a Christian can go through their whole life and never get there, never experience that. And some people never will never experience salvation because they just won't trust Jesus. But they're Christians that won't ever experience all they can experience because of unbelief, just like they did back then. And chapter 3 of Hebrews says, and so we see they were not able to enter because of unbelief. First chapter, uh, chapter 4 of Hebrews, verse 1. Therefore, let us fear while a promise remains of entering his rest. Any one of you should seem to have come short of it. Wouldn't it be terrible if you never did experience what God really wanted you to experience in your Christian life? You never became what God wanted you to become. Oh, yeah, you escaped hell and you got to heaven one day. But there's one scripture that says that some people are going to be saved smelling like smoke. You know, they're not going to have any rewards when they get there. They're not going to have accomplished anything in this life for the Lord. They're not going to have had a peaceful life here in this in this life because they never learned what resting in our Lord Jesus means. And as we, as we take apart this scripture and study it deeper and further, you'll start to understand what that rest really is. There, there therefore remains a rest for the people of God. My brothers and sisters, God does not want you to have a terrible life of fear and worry when you're on this earth. He wants you to have a, a life that's full of abundance and spirit, a spirit-filled life when you experience the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, etc., that the Holy Spirit produces and brings. And he wants you to, to be the kind of person here on this earth that can lead other people to a saving knowledge of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But see, there's so many Christians, they never get there. <laughs> they leave it for someone else. They leave it for the preacher. Say, that's the preacher's job or, or that's so-and-so's job. And they leave all of what God wants them to do and be to someone else. They never enter the rest that God promises and. And you'll see more and more about that as we get into this scripture further. Hebrews has so much to offer to us. And even though we're not Hebrew Christians, it has so many practical applications for people like you and like me, upon whom the ends of the ages, I really believe, are here. I believe, I believe we're toward the end of the age, the church age. 
And I think the scripture is so pertinent right now, and it's something we need to look at. And, and we need to warn uh, my brothers and sisters that call themselves Christians, be real careful that you don't miss the mark. Well, I've told you time and again, and you've heard it from my father, you've heard it from my son, you've heard it from other preachers, to examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. See, there's so many people that, that think because they said this sweet little prayer at some point, and, oh, I ask Jesus in my heart, everything's settled, and they just live their life as if, it, it, like it used to be. They don't turn from their sin. They don't live a different kind of life. And they live a life of fear and they live a life of worry. They live a life of toil. They never enter into the rest that God promises. You see, not only is there a rest, which we'll talk about in the, in the coming days ahead in this Bible study, there's a rest when we get to heaven one day. We're all going to rest, you know, and, and have a good rest. But there's also a rest here while you're on this earth. You don't have to go through life uh, full of toil and full of worry and full of fear because God promises us his rest. That'll, that'll be enough for tonight. Let's close for, not, for right now, and we'll get back into it later. But I would encourage you to go into the book of Hebrews and start reading and underline how many times you see the word rest, particularly in chapter 4. God bless you. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I come before you and I thank you for your word and I thank you, Lord, that we know who you are, Lord, because the scripture reveals that you are the image of, of the very God of heaven. You're his son, but you're also in his direct image or you're equal with him. And the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they're one, as you say in the word. And I pray tonight, Lord, that you'll help people out there tonight that have never accepted your deity, never confessed your deity, Lord, that they will do that now. Because, Lord, we know that the cults all deny your deity. They deny who you really are. And, Lord, we don't deny who you are. We believe that you're who you said you were. So, Lord, be with my brothers and sisters tonight as they study the word. Give them enlightenment from your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.